Sri Lanka has had a dramatic moment when its people revolted and the president was forced to resign. And it's all because of his devotion to the cause of environmental elites and organic agriculture. Well, at least that's what's being said. But is it true? Well, let's have a look. Now, I have covered the story about Sri Lanka in a recent news video and touched on why a lurch towards organic policies led to real problems. But in recent days, I've seen the telling of a story become more and more black and white. So, for example, Melanie Phillips writing in the Times of London. The principal cause of this crisis has been an obsession with organic farming. The fate of its government signals what happens when ordinary people are forced to endure the baleful consequences of an elite's ideological fixation. And Michael Schellenberger said this, The underlying reason for the fall of Sri Lanka is that its leaders fell under the spell of Western green elites peddling organic agriculture and ESG. He said, yes, there'd been tough times, but the truth is that Sri Lanka had been gradually rebuilding itself after decades of civil war and authoritarianism, and then this happened. Various others have gone even further, painting it as a simple cause and effect chain, with organic agriculture as the key mistake. Now, regular viewers will know that I've criticised, for instance, the plans of the EU in recent months to move to 25% organic agriculture. So I am only too ready to swallow those stories whole. They suit my priors just fine. But as always, I am more suspicious of the things that I would instinctively want to believe and think those things are the ones that should be scrutinised most carefully because we so readily fool ourselves in that situation. So let's put those preconceptions aside, take the metaphorical blank slate, see what's going on in this country that seems to many to be collapsing into chaos. First of all, what are the facts about what just happened, minus for spin? April last year, Sri Lanka's president Gotabaya Rajapaksa introduced a nationwide ban on the import and use of synthetic fertilisers. There had been little notice and the country's two million farmers had to work out then and there how to proceed with the imminent harvest on an organic basis. As a result, domestic rice production dropped by 20% in six months. The tea crop, Sri Lanka's most important export, was devastated. By November, the government responded to the unfolding situation and an angry backlash by partially lifting its fertiliser ban on key export crops and then fully suspending the policy for key crops. It also offered payments to farmers as compensation, although farmers complained that the amounts offered were massively insufficient. Those are the basic facts, and you can certainly see that on their own, they fit the narrative that's being promoted. Well, let's dig a little deeper and start with the context, because it seems a little odd that the president of Sri Lanka was such an ideological, radical environmentalist. I mean, if he was, how did that happen? Attitudes get shaped by circumstances. Those are often complex and out of sight. But one part I can't help but think is an interesting place to start is the history of Sri Lanka and the chemical DDT. When Sri Lanka became independent in 1948, there were around 2.8 million cases of malaria in the country. In the years following independence, the country began an aggressive programme of spraying with DDT to exterminate the malaria mosquitoes, and it was remarkably successful, in that by 1963 the numbers had gone from that 2.8 million to just 17, where it stayed for a number of years. The spraying was then suspended because of fears of the harm caused by DDT to human health, which had started in the United States. Quickly, it was back to where it had been. One million of cases of malaria in 1968, two and a half million the following year, back to the levels pre-DDT. As you can imagine, the debate space in Sri Lanka around the use of chemicals in the environment has been a pretty robust one as a result. Something which endures to this day because something that sets a standard like that doesn't change quickly. And not without cause. DDT accumulates in the livers of animals that could wipe out some of the populations at the top of various food chains. Now that didn't immediately translate into calls for organic agriculture or anything like that. Nevertheless, hold on to it as a piece of context. 
We then skip over a lot of history, some of it, as you probably know, extremely ugly history, with the terrorism of the Tamil Tigers, the civil war of that period. However, as the country recovered from that, it seemed from the outside to have made a full recovery. A number of people writing about that period described it as seeing a booming economy. That should get you a little suspicious. Because booming economies don't usually get laid low by a single misstep, however hugely misjudged. Even after Covid, you would expect more resilience in a system that had been genuinely booming. There's an old adage, how does a bankruptcy happen? The answer being slowly and then quickly. So what was happening before this sudden collapse? Well, a whole bunch of economic mismanagement seems to be the answer. The country appeared to be having a booming economy in the same way that someone maxing out their credit cards appears to have a wealthy lifestyle until they hit the limit. For a small country, foreign currency earnings are crucial. Nobody's going to take your domestic currency as payment for anything. So importing fuel and food and synthetic fertilisers and everything else depends on that. Meanwhile, the government was on a spending spree, thanks to easy loans from foreign sources. The money meant that new expressways were built, road networks were improved, all of feel-good investments that didn't in themselves generate much of a return on investment. The country spent hundreds of millions of dollars on a new international airport, which was afterwards dubbed as the emptiest airport in the world, serving as it did less than a hundred people a day. Major new developments, high-rise apartments, all sorts of things were built. And thanks to all of its spending programmes, Sri Lanka started to score highly on measures of social progress. Life expectancy went up, education, all of that. But look below the surface and you could see, for instance, that the percentage of GDP that was earned in foreign currency by selling goods into the global markets was declining year on year. While the economy seemed to be booming, it was not increasing those foreign currency inflows. Not only that, but the government's tax take decreased. The country's tax-to-GDP ratio started to decline in the mid-1990s, going from 20.4% in 1990 down to just 10.1% in 2014. There was a short-lived boost after that with some tax reforms to try to boost that tax take. But then in 2019, President Gotabaya Rajapaksa was elected on an election pledge to cut taxes. So he did so, pushing that tax-to-GDP ratio all the way down to a historic low of 8.4%. Now look, you can have a low-tax government, of course. Many Conservatives of various guises will aim to follow such a principle. But the point is, along with the commitment to low taxes, comes lower government spending. It's about making government smaller, allowing more people to keep their own money on the basis that it will feed more economic activity, which will benefit society as a result. Cutting taxes and not cutting spending, well, that doesn't end up going to such a happy place. Now, some people said that it does. You've heard of it probably, modern monetary theory. Sri Lanka's central bank governor, W.D. Lakshman, was reported to have said at a conference that domestic currency debt in a sovereign nation, I think he had Sri Lanka in mind, wasn't a huge problem because the government could print money without negative consequences. However, it seemed that Sri Lanka followed the time-honoured monetary theory because what actually happened was hyperinflation and then currency devaluation. Something of a shock to people who had quickly become accustomed to the idea that high spending and low tax was just normal life. People get used to the way they live. It's not that this pattern was especially new. Throughout its history, Sri Lanka had run big budget deficits. It's worth noting that over more than 50 years of independence, Sri Lanka had been bailed out by the IMF 16 times. 
The trouble is that if you go to the IMF, they give you money, but only on the condition that you follow more austere policies, reining in that spending, putting up them taxes, often to a degree that would be noticed rather unhappily by your population. The president did not want to go to the IMF this time. Laying off large numbers of state employees and raising taxes was not what he'd been elected to do. So instead, he went to China. China, with its Belt and Road Initiative, had been investing big in a number of developing countries, getting lots of that country's debt onto their books. A classic case study in how this could work was the Hanban Tota Port Project. The China Harbour Engineering Company struck huge and generous cash and credit deals to build this multi-billion dollar port. Now, there was no apparent immediate need for a new harbour, but when you have the problems of the idea of a wealth infusion can be persuasive, that maybe it becomes part of kick-starting more money influxes and so on. When a new government came in in 2015 and the debts were starting to mount, China stopped behaving like a benefactor, started to push its advantage, refusing to ease up on the original terms until the government handed over control of the port and 15,000 acres of land around it for 99 years. Boom! Although the lease does prohibit it from being used for naval purposes, whether that restriction holds in the face of future problems remains to be seen. I mean, in 2014, the restriction didn't stop China from parking two of its submarines there in advance of a visit to Sri Lanka of Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. In any case, China successfully built itself a stable base in a strategic area through what has been labelled as a debt trap. Not everyone holds that the Belt and Road Initiative is as centrally planned and organised as some allege. From Sri Lanka's perspective, that's not the important point. So all of this was bad enough. The country was loaded with debt. Only 15% of that was Chinese debt, but it all pushed it closer to an inevitable breaking point. It was facing a balance of payments crisis as the amount of foreign currency reserves were being depleted. Then we reached 2020. Well, nothing much happened in 2020, did it? I mean, apart from that global pandemic thing, and just like that, Sri Lanka lost one of the principal sources of its foreign currency income, which of course was tourism. The impact of that, alongside the government's refusal to go to the IMF, its widely viewed as reckless tax policy, meant that it found itself unable to borrow from the international capital markets. And in 2020, the signs of reality kicking in were visible to anyone who cared to pay attention. The government imposed severe import restrictions, including vehicle imports to stop more foreign currency leaving the country. The loans made available from China were not sufficient for the size of the problem. And the fact that in August 2021, the loan was made in Chinese renminbi rather than US dollars didn't help the ability to pay other suppliers. All of this is the backdrop then to the government's sudden announcement that it was going to ban the import of artificial fertilisers. Now was that really, as some are arguing, that in amongst all of that chaos going on, here was a government with a deep green ideological bent? Or was it driven by the same economic crisis that we've been exploring? Because it's not obvious why it would be a rational response to an economic crisis to do what they did. I mean, clearly not in hindsight, but how did it look at the time? The first thing that's worth noting is that President Rajapaska did stand on a platform that talked about environmental protection and agriculture. The civil society organisation Viafmaga had been a part of facilitating the creation of that platform. And it sounded like a classic technocrat's vehicle. The Athmaga's mission was to harness the, quote, nascent potential of the professionals, academics and entrepreneurs to effectively influence the moral and material development of Sri Lanka. It was slightly selective about which professionals and which academics, mind, and organic advocates seemed to be strongly favoured. Now, this is where that vigorous debate around the role of chemicals in the environment dovetails back into the narrative. For more than half a century, Sri Lanka had subsidised farmers to use synthetic fertiliser. 
There's more of that generous government spending, around $500 million worth per year. But unlike much of the other spending, this one actually gave a pretty good return. Yields for rice and other crops had more than doubled during that period, and the severe food shortages of the 1970s had become a distant memory. But of course, widespread chemical use, subsidised directly by government, the movement of organic true believers that had developed over the history of chemical impacts on the environment had become a real force. This fed into Raja Paksa's election manifesto, Vistas of Prosperity and Splendour. And like all political manifestos, lots of it actually sounds pretty good, since it is often framed in very general terms. Things like this, it is important to introduce scientific methods to improve sustainable agriculture, animal husbandry and plantation agriculture to achieve maximum financial gains while reducing the impact on the environment. Can't argue with that. In relation to tea specifically, it said this. To generate an additional income, we will establish a programme to utilise unused estate land to develop horticulture and organic products, which will have a demand in domestic and export markets and also other crops that complement the geographical climate. So that talks about organic production, but on new land, unused estate land, an additional higher value product to boost the export market. Seems fair enough. But the real meat came in the section headed a revolution in the use of fertiliser. Building up a community of citizens who are healthy and productive, we need to develop the habit of consuming food with no contamination with harmful chemicals. In order to guarantee the people's right to such safe food, the entire Sri Lankan agriculture will be promoted to use organic fertilisers during the next 10 years. Now that's a challenging proposition for the same reason that the EU's organic commitment is challenging. Most evidence suggests that organic agriculture in practice reduces yield per acre to produce the same quantity of food you therefore need more land, which of course means higher prices. And that's fine if you're producing extra tea to export to those with money to spend to fund their discretionary lifestyle, kind of trickier if you're producing the food for the local market. But in any case, whether it was a wise policy or not, the devil is always in the details, the principle was it was going to happen over 10 years. Which is a sort of time frame where you got the ability to course correct if some of your assumptions turn out to be wrong. As we know, that's not what happened in practice. In April 2021, as we've already said, Rajapaksa announced that the entire country would switch immediately to organic farming. As you might expect, that created a major backlash, amongst the farmers, of course, but also amongst the sort of elites you would expect technocrats to listen to. A couple of months after the announcement, a group of 30 scientists and other experts wrote an open letter to the president warning of the likely loss of production from the move, pointing out that many of the crops being used in Sri Lanka had been bred specifically for high-input agriculture. Very special concern about the potential impact on rice and tea, one a staple food, the other a very important foreign exchange earner of the country. The letter pointed out that over 70% of the country's people were dependent on agriculture directly or indirectly, and they suggested alternative approaches to dealing with the issue of chemical damage, ways to ensure fertilisers are not overused and are based on the nutrient status of the soil rather than following blanket recommendations. But there was no immediate chemical crisis that had emerged that led to the immediate ban. I mean, there were plenty of problems, sure. They needed the sort of more managed approach described maybe in the manifesto. Nothing sudden that was demanding a radical response. The alternative explanation that the government was unwilling or even unable to spend the foreign currency on the fertiliser is rather more persuasive, because there certainly was a crisis there. According to the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, the foreign reserve stood at up to $6 billion in 2019. It was down to a pitiful $1.5 billion by 2021. But you'd still have to believe that you could take the move without incurring chaos and, most importantly, additional cost. 
otherwise there's no benefit to taking it. According to some sources, Indian environmental activist Vandana Shiva was one of those that had advised Rajapaksa to take the decision. The advisory role her organisation had was mentioned on her blog, and she certainly lauded the move when it was announced. This decision will definitely help farmers become more prosperous. Use of organic fertiliser will help provide agri-products rich with nutrients while retaining the fertility of the land. Desperate people are susceptible to hearing what they want to hear and believing what is convenient to believe. Another advisor was a doctor who had reportedly convinced him, against current scientific evidence, that chronic kidney disease was associated with fertiliser use. Shortly after the announcement, the president formed a task force to implement the ban and submit a plan to create a green Sri Lanka. Many of its members were politicians and the experts that were present were exclusively from the organic lobby and often had shall we say, questionable scientific credentials? If the measure was taken for financial reasons, certainly the president sought to present it as otherwise and to seek credit for the move from the international community. So at the COP26 conference in Glasgow that year, he gave a speech boasting about the moves his government was taking and he added this comment. Although this action has been broadly appreciated, it has also met with some criticism and resistance. In addition to chemical fertiliser lobby groups, this resistance has come from farmers who have grown accustomed to overusing fertiliser as an easy means of increasing yields. He then made a pitch for wealthier nations to invest in the country's activity on organic agriculture and renewable energy. The immediate feedback from the attendees at COP26 was gushing. Impressive discourse from the Sri Lankan president. At last, national leaders at COP26 rolling their sleeves up, implementing change and dealing with the consequences. And a bunch of other such comments that didn't age tremendously well. The antagonistic tone you could detect from the president towards his critics continued after the event. As the noise around the worsening conditions continued to grow, he responded by sacking his agriculture minister and another minister of state for talking about an approaching food crisis. And he warned other members of his party and government not to say such things in public. Well, such moves have a generally poor track record in history in keeping reality at bay, and so it proved in this case. The rice harvest was significantly down from 3.39 million tonnes to just 2.92 million, a massive own goal because importing rice is far more expensive than importing fertiliser. At the same time, one of the principal earners of foreign currency, the tea plantations, yes, they saw their production drop by 40%. And while you could have made new land available to start serving an organic niche, Sri Lanka's overall tea production was larger than the entire global market for organic tea whatsoever, which is just 0.5% of the mainstream. So flooding that organic market with all that tea would mean you wouldn't even earn a premium price for what you did produce. What did organic cheerleader Vandana Shiva have to say about the initiative she'd lauded so fulsomely? Well, mostly she passed the blame. They are portraying the Sri Lankan crisis as related to a few months' stop in the import of chemical fertilisers in April 2021, she said. The ban was due to Sri Lanka's debt crisis. A ban on import does not automatically translate into policies for food sovereignty. Well, OK, but that's not what you were saying at the time. The consequences of all this we've seen play out. The apparently booming economy has been revealed instead to have been bust. Sellers have been unwilling to supply fuel to Sri Lanka because previous shipments hadn't yet been paid for. And without foreign exchange to buy what's needed, petrol, diesel and a host of basic foods and other goods, those have all been getting scarce. And prices for what's left, of course, has been spiralling. The government closed down almost all of its offices, with employees told to work from home. School shut down, train services were axed due to lack of fuel, Sri Lankans spent long hours and often multiple days queuing for fuel and other goods. At least 16 so far were reported to have actually died while standing in queues in the blazing heat.
Hyperinflation meant that the Sri Lankan rupee lost more than 80% of its value, and unsurprisingly, the country is bankrupt. It turns out that even presidents who ban people from talking about bad news can't wholly avoid it if it batters down the gates and invades your palace. Incidentally, Rajapaksa said that he wouldn't go, even after admitting to making some mistakes. Well, that didn't last, and eventually, having tried and been turned back at the airport, he eventually successfully managed to get out of the country to the Maldives. It was thought that he didn't want to resign until he was out of the country, since once he had, he would lose immunity to prosecution, and he obviously thought that might end badly for him which might be the first piece of sound judgment he'd displayed in his entire political career on best evidence. So what's the takeaway from all of this? Did environmental ideology bring down Sri Lanka? Well, no, but it was the final straw that switched the gear from the slow decline into a rapid finish. And if it hadn't been that, it would soon have been something else because the collapse was inevitable. But nevertheless, it was demonstrably misconceived and stupid, and the consequences for that sort of action has now been demonstrated for the whole world to see. Is it in itself an argument against organic agriculture? Well, in itself, no, because it was so badly implemented, you would have to allow the defenders of organics the argument that if it had been implemented in the best way, the results could have been different. The ideological anti-environmentalists won't allow that, of course. They'll simply say that this is what you get if you follow any of these sorts of policies. To be fair, the organic advocates would have more of a case to argue against that line if they hadn't fulsomely supported the programme when it was first announced. If they hadn't cheered the speech at COP26. And certainly we would like to know the role there was in the advisers to the president in making this seem like a good idea. Now, it's not an argument about could one do an organic transition. I mean, I have my own doubts about that, as I have said before. But it's more that radical changes made in desperation or for ideology almost always bring unintended consequences. And desperate or ideological people will likely blind themselves to those consequences until they can't be ignored. The president may not have been one of those ideologues, but he did take advice from those who were, reportedly. Largely because what they said accorded with what he desperately wanted to hear. But he was a catastrophically bad leader who got Sri Lanka deeper and deeper into debt, unnecessarily, apparently blind to the economic reckoning that was inevitably going to follow. When the pandemic came and Sri Lanka was one that followed others in pursuing stringent lockdowns, they had little resiliency left to survive the consequences. Bear in mind, the decay didn't start with this president. It started before. But having come in, recognising that times are tough, if you fail to identify the causes properly and you follow the exact policies that will make it worse, not better, then I'm sorry, you take a lot of the responsibility. Slogans simplifying what happened in Sri Lanka will no doubt be traded for years to come. But if anything, it's a case study in the folly of believing what you want to believe in the face of growing contrary evidence which is something the sloganeers may be unwittingly epitomising, just as much as Sri Lanka's hapless president. Now, that being said, are we guilty of ignoring similar signs of decline that we should be paying attention to? I did a video looking at one of the best cases I've heard made that, yes, that is so, about why the West is in a process of inevitable decline, Some of those factors are very familiar from this particular story, and so too is the determination of those in charge to ignore the signs. If you've made it this far, you owe it to yourself to watch that video next.